And thank you to everyone who's stuck through with us so far. Um, it's really nice to see all of you. Um, hi, Jayantha. Hi, Michael. And so we have two Michaels. Hi, Michael Hello. and Michael Chua. So nice to see everyone um, who stayed with us. So let's begin by saying Namo Tassa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Okay, um, so yes, slightly smaller group this evening, and that's good because it means we can take the text at our own pace um, and have more time to focus on, you know, what, what we'd like to focus on. So continuing um, with the text, I had a look, I prepared to see what we'll actually get through today. And it, you know, it, I was happy because it looks like we will actually get a chance to talk about stream entry before we finish up for this evening, um, which is good because, you know, we've been talking about Buddhism for a number of weeks now, and now we finally get a chance to talk about, um, you know, being enlightened, which is, um, which is really good. One of the things I wanted to mention, though, at this point, before we continue to look at the text, is actually a little bit about terminology, because when we use this English word enlightened, you know, there's a history behind it. There's a few concepts involved. The, the use of the English term enlightenment probably dates from around the 1870s. And by the 1880s, it had become relatively fixed as the English language term we use to express words like um, Pali Bodhi or Pali Sambodhi. But actually, when we think about it, there's no, um, the word Bodhi, um, it has no meaning of light anywhere in, it, in there at all. The actual meaning of the word bodhi, it comes from the verbal root um, bud, meaning, you know, to be awake. So actually, when we have a word like buddha, it's a past participle formed from bud. It means an awakened being. So I think it's important to be aware of that. Because when we think about enlightenment, what do we think about? Actually, we think about the Western Enlightenment, which was a philosophical movement, which has certain concepts involved. Um, for example, like freedom of thought, um, freedom of inquiry, um, you know, which might, they might, you know, they might ring true in an Indian concept, con you know, in an Indian uh, worldview, or they might not. Um, so I think it's important that actually when we talk about this concept of enlightenment, that um, it's good to stick to the better term, which is actually awakening, which more clearly represents the meaning of what Buddha is. So I'll try to I'll try to stick consistently to awakening this evening. But if I slip up, please forgive me. You know what I mean. And I think the person the person who was really the first one to make this point was a scholar called David McMahon. And he had a book which was published in about 2008 called The Makings of Buddhist Modernism, which looked at how some of these terms like enlightenment have actually made their way into the English language, despite the fact they're not very closely related to an Indic original. And it's important too, because when we, when we look at the text this evening, when we th think about what translation is, translation, you know, there are several ways to describe it. Translation can face in one of two directions. Either it faces toward the source text and is very focused on maintaining the distinctive characteristics of the um, original text, or it can face towards the audience and is more concerned with communicating um, in a way the audience can understand. So I think actually it was a gentleman by the name of NIDA who made these um, points originally in terms of translation theory, but they're very relevant for this evening because, you know, Ajahn Brahm's approach, sometimes it can be very audience facing. You know, he's concerned with finding ways of explaining things that make sense 
um, in the in the world view of the audience. And that's okay because it means the access barrier is actually lowered because you don't have to make so much of an investment to read the text because what happens when people, you know, when people who might come from a non-traditional Buddhist background, when they encounter a text, you know, when they encounter something they don't understand, you know, how do you lose interest? You know, that's how people's interest begins to wander. You know, you find one word you don't understand, you find the second word, and by the time you've found the third word you don't understand, you know, your interest is, is it's out the window. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, that's some of the advantages of an audience facing translation. But again, you know, in areas like um, where you do have intercultural communication, you know, you can even go the step further than having the, the translation, which is audience facing. Because sometimes, you know, you can have a message which makes sense in the, in the second language, in the target language, but still it doesn't connect with them. You know, say, for example, in terms of election campaigns, it's quite common for even in Australia for parties to run, you know, more than one election campaign for two different languages. So say, for example, um, I mean, I, I know this because I used to work in translation and I have consulted on election campaigns. Um, but say, for example, you know, you might have an election where there's um, the Chinese community campaign and the English speaking community campaign. And, you know, maybe the people who are running the campaign, what they've found is that the concerns which are relevant for the Chinese audience might not be the same set of concerns which are relevant for the English speaking audience. So, you know, if they just translated the English speaking campaign into the Chinese campaign, um, yes, the, the meaning would be there, but it wouldn't connect. So actually, sometimes with translation, it's necessary to go the step further and do what's um, typically called adaption or localization, where, you know, a specific message is put out there, you know, specifically for um, a particular target audience. So say back to the example of election campaigns, you know, you might have the campaign which is run for the English speaking audience, which focuses one year on jobs. You know, they've done the polling, the English speaking audience wants job security. But this election campaign in the same year for the Chinese speaking audience may focus on family and education. So um, when we think about translation, <laughs> you know, sometimes it's more than just conveying the meaning and content. It's also about, you know, can this text actually connect with the target audience? So Ajahn Brahm, what he's done, I think it's quite um, <laughs> entertaining actually, because he has done, he's done a little bit of adaptation. You know, it's not right or wrong um, because, you know, he has um, edited the text a little and he's been quite transparent about the fact he's done that, you know, to make it a little bit relevant to um, presumably to us all as the target audience. So we'll have a look at that as we go through. And we'll, we'll know it when we hit it <laughs> um, because um, it'll be quite obvious when it happens. Um, anyway, let's, let's get back to where we left off last week. Um, but just some minor points I wanted to make. Okay, so we were talking about right view and we had finished um, at the bottom of page, I think we were at the bottom of page 21 and we were talking about um we were talking about um you know how do we know what the buddha taught and i'm just going to make sure i have screen sharing turned on because it's better if you can see my screen so please bear with me for 10 seconds as i as i do that share screen little green button desktop one share. So I'll move the chat so you don't have the floating black boxes. Participants can now see your screen. That all looks great. So I assume that you can see that now. So yeah, we were talking about sources of authority in Buddhism. You know, so like if, uh, <laughs> you know, if you've learned this from your teacher, if you've learned this from a particular community, is that a valid source of authority? Can we say, you know, this is just my teacher's opinion. This is my teaching tradition. You know, this is what Buddhism is. And actually what it's saying here is no, that's not enough. Um, you know, there was a historical person called the Buddha 
and significant effort has been made to record his teachings um, and to preserve them more or less accurately. So if we want to know what the Buddha taught, we should uh, check with the Sutta and Vinaya um, to conclude whether this particular teacher or particular community has actually um, accurately transmitted what the Buddha taught. And when I first saw this, I thought, why is this included here? You know, why was this so important to Venerable Jnana Tiloka that he's had to put it in this particular compilation? And initially I was a bit confused, but I, I thought about it a little more and I think it is, it's quite important because, you know, I personally, I, I don't see much of this because the type of people I hang out with, they are, um, you know, generally quite educated in Buddhist texts. But we do see it a fair bit, even within the Buddhist community, um, you know, whether there is a trend towards um, guru worship or, you know, going for refuge in the guru rather than in, the, in what the Buddha taught. So I think this is quite empowering as well, that, yes, you can actually check what the teacher is saying against the, the texts. Anyway, moving on. So like I mentioned, we're going to be talking about view this evening and just continuing to work through the excerpts on view. There's a lot of different ways, right, view is conceptualized in the Sutta Pitika. Um, and, you know, you could just keep on going on and going on and going on and going on. So we're just going to stick very closely to what's actually discussed in Venerable Yanatiloka's compilation to make life easy because there's more than one way of defining it. Okay, so we're beginning from the, um, from the first sutta in the Diga Nikaya, which is the Brahmajala Sutta, um, very famous sutta, which outlines 62 types of wrong view on the basis um, of a self. So reading, what now is wrong view? There are some who state, whatever is called sight, hearing, smell, taste, or touch, that is impermanent, unstable, non-eternal, and liable to change. But what is called mentality, mano, or mind, chitta, or consciousness, vijnana, that is, that is the permanent essence, stable, eternal, not subject to change, and the same forever and ever. Okay. So we, we, we talked about this previously, yeah. We talked about the fact that, um, you know, mind, it's, um, it's also non-self. Again, very imp important point because you do get this kind of um, concept of a deathless mind that floats about even within Buddhism, um, particularly, you know, within certain strands of the Thai forest tradition, um, you know, for better or worse. And what's being said here is, you know, that we shouldn't assume that, uh, say, Nibbana is, is some state of permanent mental happiness because that's not what's being meant. Um, the Buddha's quite clearly said, um, with the three different synonyms, the synonyms mano, chitta, and vijnana, they are all impermanent. And why why have these three synonyms have why have they been singled out? Um, mano has more of a sense of the active functions of the mind, like thinking. Chitta kind of has a slightly more passive and broader sense, including things like emotions. And vijnana has the sense of consciousness or cognition. Um, this word chitta, the traditional explanation is that it comes from a root ch, meaning to accumulate. So because it accumulates experiences, therefore it is called the chitta. Um, again, vijnana, we have the root nya, meaning to know, related to our English word know and to the Greek word gnosis, and v, um, related to our English word um, or the English root by meaning to, to separate something. So it's that which knows and distinguishes. Um, all of those things, all of those three synonyms, none of them are eternal and none of them are the same forever and ever. So I think we should have covered that ground adequately by now, I hope, um, but again, as always, if there are questions, please, um, you know, just put them in the chat or feel free to unmute as we go, because this text gives us a lot of pauses and a lot of chance 
to actually look at what we've just read as we go along rather than leaving it to the end. Okay. So Michael Holgate has a comment. One sutta that explores more of right view is in the Majjhima Nikaya at number nine. Um, sure, that's the, the Samadhiti Sutta. Um, you know, very nice sutta taught actually by Venerable Sariputta. Um, but I mean, you know, the, the Samadhiti Sutta, you know, there's also more suttas in addition to the Samadhiti, Samadhiti Sutta. There's also, um, say, the Maha um, Ch Chattarisaka Sutta towards the end of the Majjhima Nikaya in the third book of the, the, of the Majjhima. Um, so, yeah, more than one way of looking at right view. Although the Samadhiti Sutta is it's quite a good source, though, because when we think about the Majjhima Nikaya, it's made up of three books. So you have the, the first 50, the middle 50, and the end 50. Um, so the fact that this um, the Samadhiti Sutta, the fact that it's located in that first book of the Majjhima Nikaya is actually telling us something. And what it's telling us is that this is a doctrinally important sutta. And it's also telling us this is likely to be a very reliable sutta. Because what happens uh, with the Majjhima Nikaya, the way that the Majjhima Nikaya is compiled, you know, the editors, um, they, they did a very straightforward thing. The content that is later in the Majjhima Nikaya is the content in the third book. So if the content is early, if it's in books number one or two, um, it's more likely to date from the Buddha's lifetime than the content in book number three. Um, so just something to keep in mind. When we have these modern reference numbers, like where you see the reference number nine after Majjhima Nikaya, that system isn't actually used traditionally. That's a very modern system that's been popularized, um, you know, possibly... Um, in part also by Wisdom Press in that it's a system I think, I think they use um, in their publications, the modern numbering system where you just number each sutta with a unique identifier so that every sutta, say in the Majjhima Nikaya, has a number from 1 to 152. But that's not actually the traditional system. You know, the traditional system is to give the book number and then the number of the sutta within the book. So you wouldn't say like Majjhima Nikaya number nine, it would be Majjhima Nikaya book number one, Sutta number nine. Um, so that's the more traditional system. And it actually, it helps to communicate that there are, there's a difference between the books in the Majjhima, like the Majjhima Nikaya is not all the same. And I think sometimes the modern numbering system, it actually, it hides that distinction because, you know, when it's just Majjhima Nikaya, nine or Majjhima Nikaya 152, you know, you can't, uh, you know, you can't just look at it and say this sutta is in the, the third book, although you'd know that because like presumably, uh, you know, you can know which set of 50 it's in. Um, but yeah, um, you know, just something handy to keep in mind. And the same is true of the Diga Nikaya actually like, you know, what did, what did the compilers of the Diga Nikaya do with the Diga Nikaya? Again, they did the really obvious thing. You know, they put the later content at the end. So by the time we get to the end of the Diga Nikaya, like by the time we get to something like the Sangeeti Sutta, which is Sutta, um, you know, number 33 in the modern system in the Diga Nikaya, actually it's already like proto-Abhidharma. So there's a very strong connection between the later suttas of the Diga Nikaya and say like an, a proto-Abhidharma text like the Patisambhita Magga. Um, and again, the same is true of the, that third book of the Majjhima Nikaya. It's also, it has concepts which we could describe as being proto-Abhidharma. So, I mean, how is this all relevant to right view? I'm not like on a complete dig digression. There is um, a connection here because one of the suttas I mentioned that deals with um, right view, you know, um, you know, some of these suttas are in the third book, some of them are already um, getting into Abhidhamma territory. So that's why the sutta that Michael has mentioned is good because it's, it's more like pure sutta material 
rather than proto Abhidharma material, which happens to be in this sort of Pitaka. So Adrian said, thanks, that's really handy to know about the third book of the Majjhima Nikaya. Um, I'm here to help. So, so thank you. Okay, let's keep on moving on because that was maybe a slightly unnecessary digression. Okay, so any questions? Are we all cool with the content? The content itself should be okay though. Um, because I mean, this is quite famous, yeah? Because when we look at suttas, like say, um, the Mahatanha um, Sankhaya Sutta, where we have the fisherman Sati, and this fisherman, you know, the Buddha, <laughs> the Buddha actually calls him, I, I think, a, a fool, because, you know, he's made this proposition to the Buddha, that it's the same consciousness that, that gets reborn from life to life. And the Buddha, you know, his reply to that proposition is, you foolish man, you know, have you ever, have I ever, have you ever heard me say that? Because the Buddha has gone to extreme lengths to tell us that consciousness is impermanent. Um, and that's why, you know, he, he has every right to call the fisherman Sati a fool, because he's there to the, trying to tell the Buddha to, his, to the Buddha's face that the Buddha has taught a permanent consciousness. Um, but, you know, for whatever reason, this point um, still isn't as widely known as Buddha, in Buddhism as it should be. So there are people who call themselves Buddhists, but are still advocating views that are this, this, um, this view of the, fish, the fisherman sati, that there is a permanent consciousness. So very good to get that straight from day, it's not quite day one, but from the beginning, that there is no such thing as a permanent consciousness. Um, any, wait, there was something else I was going to mention about that. Because again, back to the extreme lengths that the Buddha took to show us this, you know, in the Upanishads, there's this term, um, vig Vignana um, Gana, a term which possibly predates Buddhism. So we have the term that we know, this term Vijnana, meaning uh, consciousness. And we have another term which we haven't talked about so far yet. Gana means like, um, you know, like a solid mass, you know, like a heap. So in the Upanishads, in this, um, in Vedic Hinduism, you have this concept of consciousness as a solid mass. So what does the Buddha come along and do with that concept? Um, actually, Buddhism, you know, he takes that, the Buddha takes that perception of a solid mass, the, the perception of the heap, and he breaks it up. Um, so instead, instead of this concept of a solid mass of consciousness, what do we have? The Buddha says, actually, we have six consciousnesses. So it's a very important, um, you know, intellectual development, very important realization. And actually probably, you know, one of Buddhism's most important contributions um, to theory of mind. Um, so very, very interesting. Um, okay, so moving, moving on. Um, so we're at, we're at DN22, you can see my cursor there. Um, so DN22 being in the Deegan Nikaya, in the Book of Long Discourses, um, and in the Mahasatipatthana Sutta. Um, why is it called the Mahasatipatthana Sutta? Maha meaning great or long, expanded. Satipatthana, um, sati being mindfulness, patana being the foundations. So this is the long discourse on the four foundations of mindfulness. And it's slightly, there is a Majjhima Nikaya version of the same sutta, but the Diga Nikaya version has been expanded. So um, there's a lot more doctrinal content that's been put into it. And again, you know, there are theories, quite plausible theories about why this is. Um, these early books, especially, like I said, book one of the Majjhima Nikaya and of the Diga Nikaya, um, there's a theory that these were used in monastic education. And the idea being, if you never get a chance to learn the whole Diga, or if you never get a chance to learn the whole Majjhima, you know, at least you learn book one. So what's happened sometimes is that these suttas have been fleshed out um, to make them into a more comprehensive syllabus in their own right. So 
if you never get a chance to learn anything else, at least you get a chance to learn these concepts um, when you are going through book one. Um, so anyway, continuing on, and what now is right view? So we've had wrong view. We've started from the negative side, and now we get the relief. Now we get the positive side. We get the right view. Um, so right view being the Four Noble Truths. So the text reads, it is the understanding of the Four Noble Truths, suffering, i.e. dukkha, the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the way of practice leading to the cessation of suffering. This is called right view. Um, we talked about the Four Noble Truths previously. So, you know, it should be straightforward. Right view includes um, the perception of the Four Noble Truths. Um, I mean, it's interesting how Venerable Jnana Tilak has chosen to present this, that we have wrong view um, over here as the perception of uh, permanence. Um, you know, say that the mind is permanent and right view over here as the Four Noble Truths. Um, I mean, those two things aren't necessarily a pair, but I mean, it's interesting that Venerable Yana Tilok has chosen to present it that way. Um, anyway, if there's no questions, we'll keep moving on. Um, so like Michael mentioned earlier, um, the Samaditi Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya is an important sutta for this topic. And that's what we have referenced here as Majjhima Nikaya number nine. So that is in fact the Samaditi Sutta that Michael kindly pointed out before. So, um, you know, Venerable Sariputta is, um, is asking, you know, what are the good and the bad and what is their cause? So the good and the bad, like knowing right from wrong, is also a definition of right view. So the bad here being intentional killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, malicious gossip, harsh speech, useless talk, desire relating to the five senses, ill will and wrong view. These are the bad. And we also have the causes of the bad as wanting aversion and delusion. And then we have the definition of the good as refraining from intentionally killing living beings, stealing sexual misconduct from lying, malicious gossip, harsh, harsh speech and from useless speech, contentment, loving kindness and right view is the good. Renunciation, compassion and wisdom are the roots of the good. Um, I mean, because this is the ex excerpt, I'm not sure if it's very clear here. But the point being to have right view, right view is to know the good and the roots of the good and the bad and the roots of the bad. So maybe this particular um, set is familiar to some of you. I mean, does anyone know um, what this set is? Is it looking familiar to anyone? Um, the set where we have the set of 10 things. I'm guessing I'm guessing some of you have actually seen this before. Just looking, looking on chat. I mean, uh, Jayantha, you've probably seen this before, yeah? This particular set of 10. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I mean, which, which, set, which set of 10 is this? Okay, um, Elise says yes. the precepts. Um, yeah, okay, that's a good start. We can work from that. Um, it's not quite what I'm after, but we can, I can use that. So fa thank you, Elise. Um, so yeah, we do have, we have the precepts there. Um, but we actually, we have a little bit more than that. So when we think about the five precepts, okay, we've got number one there. We have refraining from intentionally killing living beings. Um, that's one. Stealing is two, 
Um, sexual misconduct is three. Lying is four. Then we have some other stuff added here. Um, and we don't have number five. So, I mean, that's the, the first thing that's a bit different here is that we have the first four of the five precepts, but the speech element has been expanded um, to include, you know, we have Misawada, which is the lying. Um, we have uh, Pisinawacha, which is the, like the divisive speech. This word Pisina, it comes from another word. It's related to another word, which is Paisunya. So pay or P means like what's dear to you. Um, you know, so the dear people, you call them peer. So if you have pisuna wacha, you know, sunya means uh, like um, to destroy. So uh, pisuna um, is that which is paisunya in that it's that which destroys people's dearness and people's closeness. So we can also say divisive speech. Um, harsh, harsh speech, the parasavacha, and the useless speech, the sampalapa. But, so what's happened here is that the speech element has been drawn out um, to give a little bit more context around what actually um, counts as, uh, as wrong speech. And we notice something that's a bit different to the precepts as well too, in that we have the mental element drawn out. So you know, actually, normally when we recite the five precepts, we don't have such a focus on the mental element. But here what we have, um, we have the, you know, we have the addition of the, um, the three right intentions or the three right motivations. And there is a particular name for this particular um, set, which is the Dasakusala Dhamma. So the 10 wholesome states. And the Buddha said, you know, if you want to go to heaven, this is how you do it. Um, these, these are the ones you're after. So very um, interesting. I, I mean, it's interesting to, to me, but, you know, it, it, it should be quite predictable that it has been drawn out this way. Um, because, you know, especially if we think historically, you know, why do we actually have five precepts in Buddhism? Why don't we have six precepts? Why don't we have seven precepts? Um, you know, this particular set of, of actions um, was not invented by the Buddha. There is a prior set which is called the Mahavratas in, Jain in Jainism. So um, the first four of the five Jain uh, Mahavratas, actually they're the same as what we know from Buddhism. So sometimes you do see like a set of four precepts as opposed to a set of five um, without alcohol included. And that's also found in the Sutta Pitaka. Um, although the normal set is the, the set of five where you have alcohol included, um, you know, refraining from alcohol as opposed to drinking alcohol. Um, and again, this is a little bit different from Jainism because number five in Jainism is a parigraha. So being non-greedy. So, I mean, it's a, it's clearly something that, um, you know, as part of the shared um, moral heritage of the um, Magadha region, um, you know, of East and Central India. Um, so just a little bit of, um, you know, detail. But I think, you know, this, this set is quite nice because, you know, we have actions by body, speech and mind. So each of them have been drawn out in full. So another way of looking at um, right view according to the Samaditi Sutta. Um, anyway, continuing on. So we also have right view regarding the khandas. Um, here the English being the five components of existence. I mean, I don't know what a component of existence is, you know, uh, <laughs> You know, in English, you'd say it's all Greek to me. In Sinhala, you'd probably say it's all Apavramsha to me. Um, you know, so whether it's English or Pali doesn't make much difference. Um, you know, components doesn't really mean that much. But, you know, in Pali, you call these khandas. Um, 
I mean, Upper Brahmsha being a type of Indian language, you know, a dead language that, you know, you're not really expected to understand. So um, Europeans say it's all Greek. Um, Indians say it's all Upper Brahmsha to me. Okay, so but we'll try to make it a little bit less Greek. We'll try to make it slightly comprehensible. Okay, so looking, um, a reading from the Samyutta Nikaya. Um, I think this is actually, um, this particular sutta may be called um, a sutta vata or something like that. Um, the uneducated people, the people who haven't been taught. Um, I mean, sometimes with the Sangyutta Nikaya too, there's so many small suttas. What's happened is that editorially, the titles have been added later. So, you know, whether some of these small suttas in the Sangyutta Nikaya, whether they actually have titles or not, you know, it's open to discussion historically. Um, anyway, so this is the uneducated people. You view your body as impermanent, suffering. Oh, sorry. I got it wrong. This is the, maybe this is the educated people. This is the people who know what they're doing. This is the, the right thing. So right view being, you view your body as impermanent suffering and non-self. You regard experience Vedana as impermanent suffering and non-self. You regard perception as impermanent suffering and non-self. You regard will as impermanent suffering and non-self. You regard consciousnesses um, as impermanent suffering and non-self. This is right for you. Um, and again, it looks very easy on paper, y you know, because like wrong view is hard to see. That's that's the that's the issue with being unawakened. You know, we don't know what we don't know. Um, it's like the, the Iraq War, like the unknown unknowables. So when it looks on when we see it on like like, like that on paper, you know, we might think. You know, I know that somewhere hidden, I have this ego view, but I can't really pin it down. Like, what's the mistake I'm making? Is it that, you know, is it that somehow it's at this reflexive level, um, I'm still mistaking consciousness as, um, as being permanent? And, you know, that's, that's just what it's like to be unawakened, that we rarely get to see the ego view directly. But what we see, we see the frustration, we see the, the wanting, we see the confusion, you know, all of those things um, that come from the distorted perception. Um, we have this concept, again, in Buddhism of vipalasa or distortion. So actually, when we, when we take um, what's impermanent to be permanent, what's um, suffering to be pleasant and what's non-self to be self. Um, you know, that's the, the it's, um, it's actually a type of cognitive error that drives um, in turn all of those negative emotions. So, I mean, that's the difference in part between Buddhism and psychology. Um, psychology, it, it, it's trying to find ways maybe to manage your negative emotions, um, or, or to regulate them to like a place in life, you can kind of deal with them. The, the point of Buddhism is, is to look for the root distortion that leads to all of this um, negativity. And that's really the optimistic message of Buddhism that, you know, these things we experience, you know, anger doesn't have to be a part of our life. Um, greed doesn't have to be a part of our life. If we can identify um, the error that's actually driving, you know, the whole gamut of, of negativity, um, we can live without those things and we can have a happy life. So, um, you know, there's benefits of Buddhism in this life, um, and the next, um, but I think this is just rehashing what we've talked about previously. So I think it's okay to keep moving through. So moving on to unprofitable questions. Um, sorry, I just need to minimize my screen so you're not getting the black boxes again. I don't know why it's doing that. 
Mm. Ah, much better. Okay, so this um, this section was why I had to give the little spiel earlier when we began this evening um, about translation theory and the concept of source facing translation, which faces the um, you know the original text um, as opposed to the concept of audience facing translation, which faces in a very you know in a slightly abstract sense um, the target audience and their worldviews because what Ajahn Brahm's done um, he has done a little bit of editing here uh, you know so this is this is really audience facing adaptation um, and I mean that's okay as long as you know Ajahn has been um, very transparent about it so let's read from Majjhima Nikaya um, number 63, which is the Chula um, Malunkya Sutta. So, if anyone should say thus, I will not become a practicing Buddhist until I discover whether this universe is eternal or not, finite or infinite, or whether my permanent essence and my body are the same, or my permanent essence is one thing, but my body is another, or whether the Buddha persists after death, does not persist after death, both persists and does not persist after death, or neither persists nor does not persist after death, that person would die before they found out. Okay, suppose a person were shot with a gun and medics would come to help them. Then that person said, Hang on a minute, who pulled the trigger? What type of gun did they use and why did they shoot me? Moreover, let me see your medical qualifications first. I will not let you treat me until you answer all these questions. That person would be considered to have wrong view and might die before their questions were answered. Okay, so if you have been following, you may have noticed that this particular translation refers to guns. Um, I believe the original talks about arrows. So uh, maybe Ajahn is assuming that you all have more familiarity with guns than with arrows. Um, I mean, my little sister enjoys shooting. She has her gun license. But, you know, I'm assuming that most of you don't actually have much familiarity with either of those things. And, you know, that's probably a good thing. Um, anyway, so we have we have two things here. And again, the context of this original question, I think it was a monk who was going, he came to the Buddha and said, look, you know, I've ordained as a monk and you've never told me, you, you know, you never, you, you, you've claimed that you're enlightened, but you've never told me, is the universe eternal? You know, you've never told me, like, is it infinite? And I want my money back. You know, I'm going to disrobe actually, um, unless you tell me Buddha about these things. And, um, you know, but the Buddha's never promised to tell anyone any of this stuff. And actually the point here being that, um, you know, a person who asks these questions will actually die before they find out the answer to them. Um, and there's a particular name actually um, for these questions in Pali. Um, I think they're actually called the avyakata questions. Um, they're in, in, indeterminate. Um, I mean, working from the end backwards. So we have questions here about the status of the Buddha um, after after parinibbana, after after death, and we have a particular form of logic here. This particular form of logic is quite um, distinctive of the Indian philosophical tradition. Um, it's called the Chattis, Chattis Koti. So we have the first statement, um, you know, the Buddha persists after death, which is the positive statement. We have the statement, the Buddha does not persi persist after death, which is the negative statement. And we have the statement, both persists and does not persi persist after death. So uh, both. And then we have the, the neither statement. So again, aiming to cover all um, possibilities.
Um, so the point being, this is a question, it's like dividing by zero, you know, there is no answer to it because it's actually a, um, you know, it's a bad question. Um, I'm just trying to close chat again. So the Buddha has done many things in his teaching career, but, you know, he has not answered these um, this set of questions. Okay. And the particular reason that's given here, um, is quite interesting because firstly, it shows the, um, the pointlessness of engaging with this type of thinking because the reason the reason the buddha um taught for so many years in the world was you know it was out of compassion that the buddha saw people suffering and i mentioned the other day that you know we have this statement in the udana that people are like the fish in the shallow water you know how can they <laughs> how can they ex experience joy you know there's no <laughs> there's no no joy for fish in shallow water um, so the Buddha, like the Buddha really saw suffering and we get so desensitized, you know, we, we take it, we take so much of our suffering for granted that we, you know, that maybe we go through our day and, you know, we don't feel happy. Um, but the Buddha, he actually, he really sees it. And, you know, the Buddha wants to, to be able to, to provide the cure. And, you know, what, what has the Buddha seen? The Buddha's seen samsara. You know, the Buddha's seen the mountains of bones and the oceans, which are like blood. Um, and, you know, just the sheer scope of it, that this is the reality of the human situation. So I think it's quite interesting that the, um, that the text is saying here that, you know, um, there's no point asking, <laughs> um, you know, questions about what type of gun it, gun it is, um, etc. if you've just sorry just being shot um um anyway sorry just sneezing it's something that Bante Sujato and I have in common actually we both have hay fever so um spring at the moment I, I took an antihistamine earlier but you know you can't you can't get all the pollen Okay. So a person, the type of person um, who's concerned with these um, avyakata questions um, is considered to have wrong view because they're concerned with questions um, which relate to the existence of nonsensical things like a soul, um, etc., and not concerned um, with the really relevant question, um, you know, which is suffering and the end of suffering. Um, you know, at least I assume this is what this is getting at, um, because we've just talked earlier about right view being, um, you know, the, the Four Noble Truths. Um, anyway, we can keep moving on. Um, I, um, again, you know, maybe some of you did want to know whether the universe was eternal or not that the Buddha is probably not the person um, to help you with that one. Okay, so continuing on from the Sutta Nipata, um, where we have capital S little n, that indicates the Sutta Nipata, as opposed to capital S capital N, which indicates the Sangyata Nikaya. Um, the word Nipata means a collection um, the root pat means to fall. Ni in this context means something um, like a compilation or like a body. So we have like this word nikaya, which is a body of, you know, a body of uh, suttas. Um, so ni, sorry, I wasn't quite clear, but what I should have said is that ni has the concept of like um, togetherness. So when we have it in these in these uh, in this particular context 
what we actually, you know, this word nipata, it's like the suttas, they fall together, they have been compiled together. Um, so quite similar use of the prefix ni that we see um, in the word nikaya. So actually the best way to translate nipata is probably something like a collection or a compilation. Um, I just wanted to point that out though, because I saw something, you know, sometimes you do see translations that are a little bit ridiculous. Like one place I saw Sutta Nipata translated as Sutta's falling down, um, you know, which is what it is, it is what the part, um, part of the word Nipata means. It does mean falling down, but actually if we think about falling together, you know, it, it's just a collection or a compilation. So Sutta Nipata means a compilation of Suttas. Um, anyway, moving on. Therefore, the one who seeks their own welfare should pull out this bullet, this bullet of unhappiness, pain and suffering. Uh, again, not really sure that the Buddha ever encountered bullets. The Pali here um, being Sala. Sala meaning an arrow, a dart, a thorn, etc. Um, I mean, I don't think the metaphor really works as well when we talk about bullets because, you know, you could imagine that you could pull an arrow out of yourself because there's kind of something to grab, but to pull a bullet out of yourself, you know, you might have to do some type of like minor um, self-surgery to actually reach in and pull out the bullet. So the metaphor can only really extend this so far. Um, but the point being here that, you know, if you love yourself, that's what you should do. You should look. Um, what what is the cause of my unhappiness, pain, and suffering? And you know you should <laughs> you should deal with it. That you know why are we alive? Um, there's no point being born and and dying at the end of our life and being in a worse situation than we were than we started. You know life's precious. Life's important. Um, you know if we live, we should we should have more understanding at the end of our lives than at the beginning. Um, so that's what the, the Buddha is saying, that's what we should do. And there's a lovely dialogue actually um, in the suttas where we have one of the Buddha's leading supporters, um, King Pasenadi, and one of his wives, which is Queen Malika, and they're having a discussion and uh, <laughs> King Pasenadi asks his wife, Queen Malika, um, you know, in the whole world, who's the person who's most dear to you? And she says, myself. And King Pasenadi, he's a bit upset about that because, you know, he's expecting his wife to say, actually, you know, no, sweetheart, you're the most important person to me um, in the world. But um, Queen Malika is smart. You know, she's always had this bit of a reputation as being, you know, the smarter one of the couple. And she said, um, she said it quite correctly, you know, <laughs> that the person um, that we have the most influence on in life is, is actually ourselves. So we can't even begin to, to think about helping other people until we've really dealt with our own, um, you know, our own uh, chaos that's inside of us. You know, otherwise we're just going to be a, a messed up person going around and not dealing with that own inner messed upness okay moving on so we have mn63 um still in the chula malunkia sutta well one with the view life brackets the universe is eternal the holy life is without meaning brackets there is no end of you and for one with the view life brackets the universe is not eternal again the holy life is without meaning brackets, you are going to end anyway. Whether one has the view the universe is eternal or the view the universe is not eternal, there is rebirth, there is aging, there is death, there are sorrow, crying, pain, unhappiness and distress, the destruction of which I prescribe in this very life. Okay, um, like I said, I used to work as a translator. Um, so I've seen bad translation and I've seen good translation. And I'm going to put this in the basket of bad translation. I'm not saying that it's anyone's fault, but this is actually really hard to read. Um, 
you know, I'm very suspicious of brackets and translations in general, and there's a couple of reasons why I, I don't, I just don't like brackets. One of them is that in terms of like, if we look at translating religious texts in the world today, the translations which have brackets are quite often the most dubious ones. For example, in terms of Quran translation, there's a particular translation which is referred to as um, the Sahih international version of the Quran, and it is notorious for having brackets. So the assumption is that you, the reader, um, cannot understand the text without the stuff in the brackets. And what happens is that stuff in the brackets is where interpretation um, gets inserted in. So, you know, the, 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 cons the issue of brackets in translation, you know, we go from it being a translation issue to suddenly, you know, to becoming a social issue because, you know, there are consequences of religious translation. And, you know, we have these entire versions of, you know, of major religious texts that are circulating in the world today that are influencing international politics, which are influencing legal and social regimes that are relying on the stuff in the in the brackets so anyway i have a very firm anti-bracket position um but that's okay we can we can deal with um we can deal with the brackets because i don't think anyone's going to use um <laughs> the, the word of the buddha you know to write their country's con constitution so we can we can work with it so we have a couple of propositions. So we have the view the li that um, life or the universe is eternal. And what's being said here um, is when you, um, when you have this view, there's no point being spiritual. There's no point being religious. Um, you know, maybe because there's no liberation. Um, you know, it just goes on and on. And... You know, for someone who has the view that life or the universe is um, not eternal, um, again, the there's no there's no point even trying because you know we're all going to end anyway. Um, so whether one has the view um, the universe is eternal or the view the universe is not eternal, there is rebirth, aging, death, sorrow, pain, lamentation, distress, etc., etc., etc. Anyway, so I think maybe reiterating the point that these um, indeterminate questions, these abhyakata questions um, are a bit pointless because no matter actually what you believe about them, you know, if you believe that the universe goes on forever um, or that the universe is going to end, um, you still haven't dealt with what the Buddha is describing as being the key point, um, which is your own existential position where you will in fact um, suffer and according to you know the awakened buddha um for multiple lifetimes unless you actually deal with it um so i personally I, I i find this a little bit difficult to follow um with the brackets but after we've drawn it out hopefully it should make a little bit more sense um so are we all following um, can we get a thumbs up? Who's, who's, who's still with us? Okay, thumbs up is great. Thanks, Elise. Thanks, Adrian. Um, thanks, Eugene. That's wonderful. Um, I mean, when you're on Zoom, it's a bit easy if you aren't following. <laughs> you know, you can just go out and get a cup of tea. Um, but, it, you know, it's, it's good to, to follow because um, who knows? We, we might never get a chance to come back to this, this text later, so may as well get it sorted. Um, sorted now while we're while we're all here okay so moving on we've done mn63 which is the chula mulunkya sutta and moving on to mn64 which is the maha mulunkya sutta so we have the short version and the long version so the five basic fetters see this is getting exciting this is getting up to actual interesting stuff um, i told you we were going to talk about awakening so we have this concept of um, sangyojana um you know which is we have this word yoke in english a yoke being the thing that the cattle put around their neck or rather that the cattle have put around their neck um to drive the bullock cart or you see like the um 
like the ox pulling um, pulling a plow or something like that. So that's what's meant. Um, I mean, we have a relationship between this English word yoke and the in Indic root yuj, meaning to yoke. Like there, there's a clear, um, like it's basically the same word. Um, English, of course, being an Indo-European language um, and very closely related to the Indo-Aryan family of languages. Anyway, here, one who has not seen the Dhamma, um, brackets, Putujana, abides with a mind addicted and attached to a view of a permanent essence, and they do not even seek an escape from the long-standing wrong view of a permanent essence. When that wrong view of a permanent essence has become habitual, it is regarded as a basic fetter. Okay. Um, like I said, this is an audience facing translation. Um, I think the Pali, like I can't actually think of a Pali word that means basic fetter. Um, I'm guessing the actual Pali here is something like Arambhagya um, Sam Samyojana, um, you know, often translated as uh, lower fetter or something like that. So I'd say that lower fetter is probably the more typical translation. And we have this word um, Putijana. So, I mean, <laughs> uh, Pritak is an individual. Um, jhana is a, a person, so Sanskrit pritak, um, Pali putu. So they are a person who has a conception of an individual, um, a person, an ordinary person who hasn't seen the Dhamma. So these are people who just, they have their reflexive sense of this is a soul, this is myself. Um, so, you know, these ordinary people, these Putujanas, they have um, a view of a permanent essence that has become habitual. So it's deeply psychologically rooted on a subconscious level. Um, it's on the level of what we'd call an Anusaya in Pali. It's something we're born with. And unless we do something about it, it's something we'll die with. Um, and what's being said here is that's actually... Um, it's one of the lower fetters that becomes um, broken by the awakening experience. So continuing on, one who abides with a mind addicted and attached to skeptical doubt, to a belief that rites and rituals are sufficient in themselves to reach awakening, to desire for the five senses, dot, 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 to aversion, dot, 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 and they do not even seek an escape from these states. Then, um, when these states have become habitual, they are regarded as the five um, basic or lower fetters. So we have this concept of, you know, what is an awakened being? And we talk about um, the four pairs or the eight, um, the eight types of persons. When we take... Um, awakened beings individually, um, you know, they get split up into eight. When we take them in pairs, there's four. So um, the first pair being um, those who are practicing towards stream entry and those who have attained um, stream entry, stream entry being a translation um, of the term, the Pali term, Sotapanna, Sota um, being a stream, um, Apana being something like to attain, obtain. So the people um, who have attained the stream, um, we could say they are awakened on the level of view. So there's a very lovely simile um, in the Kosambi Sutta, which says, you know, if we think about awakening like a well an arahant someone who's fully awakened there's someone who who's drank the water from the well um, a solapana has just seen it so they know the water's there but they haven't fully drunk it yet so we can make the analogy between seeing the water um, and having 
right view. So a, a soda panna, they still they still do have this subconscious reflexive um, sense of ego, but um, they've seen it. You know, for the first time, they um, they they know what it is. They understand the kandas, and you know, at least on that conceptual level, they they really get it. Um, and because of that, because of the importance and depth of that penetration, um, you know, the Buddha said they only have seven more rebirths left in in samsara. There's no eighth um, existence for them. So, um, you know, talking about what a, what a stream entry actually is, um, Ajahn, you know, is quite keen to make the point that stream entry, it is an experience. So if someone says, you know, I've attained stream entry, this is something we can pinpoint in a particular location and time. And I, I think the Pali commentary is actually um, the Samantha Pasadika, which is a vinya commentary. Um, you know, it recommends this actually as a way of interrogating someone who's made a claim <laughs> um, to awakening because you can ask them, you know, when and where did this happen? So, um, yeah, just a point to keep in mind about stream entry because, you know, when you are teaching, sometimes people do actually come up to you and say, um, you know, by the way, I'm, I'm a stream enter. I just wanted to let you know. Um, and it, you know, it always puts you in a slightly awkward, awkward position that someone's, <laughs> um, you know, uh, that so someone's come up to you and, you know, they've felt compelled, um, to, to share this with you. And I suppose like, you know, how do you even answer to that? You know, like maybe you might say like, why, why do you think that you're a stream winner? And sometimes where people do get this wrong um, is they think, well, <laughs> you know, I have, I have all of the factors of stream winning. You know, when I think about the four factors of stream winning, what factors does a stream winner have? You know, they have unshakable, um, unshakable faith in the Buddha, unshakable faith in the Dhamma, unshakable faith in the Sangha, and they have morality. And they think, well, actually, you know what? I, I, I believe in the Buddha. I believe in the Dhamma. I believe in the Sangha. And I'm a good person, like I, I have morality, um, ipso facto, <laughs> you know, therefore I, I must be a stream winner. And, you know, the point that needs to be made is that until you have actually had this experience of stream winning, um, your faith in Buddhism isn't complete because you do not know what Buddhism is. You know, you, you may think you know what Buddhism is, but until you have actually like literally seen through the khandas, uh, until you have until you have correct knowledge of dependent origination and the four noble truths um etc 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 all of these things that go together with the experience the concrete experience of stream entry which exists as an awakening experience i.e something that happens to you on a particular date in a particular time in a particular place um merely having something that could be described as, as faith and morality uh, doesn't actually make you a stream enterer. So I gather that the people who are here this evening, um, you know, if you are stream enterers, that's great. That's like, that's really cool. That's a wonderful thing. Um, but, you know, if you are going to go up to the teacher at the meditation retreat and say, by the way, I'm a stream enterer, um, it may be useful to put a little bit of reflection into that beforehand. Um, <laughs> Because you know, merely possessing um, faith does not actually qualify one as a stream entry. Um, so to pass Ajahn Brahm's um, stream entry test, <laughs> actually Ajahn Brahm, I, I suspect he has more than one stream entry test. But the one that he tells people about, <laughs> um, you, you know, you can't just say actually I, ha I have this this sense of deepening um, faith and. You know, I feel over time I've understood non-self better because stream entry, you know, it's a, it's a concrete ex experience. Um, you know, the other, one of Ajahn's other questions, um, you know, is are things getting better? Because for someone who's a stream enterer, there is no, you know, there's no more hell for them. There's no more lower realms and it's only up. So if you are, a, if you're someone and you 
think, oh, I'm a stream enterer. And if things are getting worse for you, if you have like a return of those um, fetters that you thought were severed, um, so if one week, you know, you if one week you thought, great, I've smashed my doubt, I, I've seen the kundas, I, I get it now, I get non-self. And then a week later, if that view comes back, well, then obviously, um, you know, that's not stream entry because stream entry is the permanent and, and irreversible destruction um, of those first um, three fetters, those ones we mentioned, um, the self-view, um, the, the doubt, the attachment to um, the grasping of, of rites and rituals. Um, so what, what actually counts as stream entry is the permanent destruction of those things as a consequence of, um, of, of seeing. Um, anyway, I'm sure none of you would do that, but something you know that's useful to, to, to keep in mind. So if you want to go try it out on your meditation teacher, <laughs> you know, at least you have a bit of, um, uh, you can do it in a slightly more sophisticated way than some other people. Although I don't really recommend trying this out on your meditation teacher uh, because, you know, in the Buddha's time, like stream entry isn't really a big deal. There were a lot of stream enterers um, it's more arahantship that people would go back to the meditation teacher and say, uh, you know, they'd make some type of cryptic statement. Uh, you know, like, it's not better, it's not worse, it's not the same. So maybe when, when you're all arahants, that's when you can go and bug your, your meditation teachers, you know, that I've actually done something that's worth writing home about. Um, because before that, you know, it's a bit, um, you know, it's not really worth um, writing home about anything less than that. Okay, so where was I going? Okay, back to the chat. Cindy says to everyone, if there is no permanent essence, what is it that is reborn through lifetimes? So your mental continuum, um, you know, it takes up different, um, embodiments throughout lifetimes. So there is a term in Pali, it is Vijnana Sota, meaning the stream of consciousness. Um, I hope that helps, Cindy. So when we think about, you know, what is a Vijnana Sota, what, you know, what is a stream of consciousness? Um, it's, you know, it's, it's moments of consciousness that have a causal relationship to each other. And, you know, that causal relationship doesn't necessarily mean that something has to move uh, physically from place A to place B. You know, that's not what causality is, right? Um, it, it just means that, there, um, you know, it's something that exists and we can infer the relationship um, on the basis of what we've observed. So... Uh, yes, there's something that, like as a phenomena, we can call the Vijnana Sota, we can call the stream of consciousness. No, that doesn't mean that there's, um, you know, anything permanent there. Um, so does that answer your question, Cindy? Okay, anyway, I, I, hope, that's, I hope that's more clear for you. Yes, thank you. Okay, great, wonderful. So from Eugene to everyone, the mind as a permanent essence, stable, eternal, not subject to change is clearly wrong view. Thanks, Eugene. I'm, I'm so glad someone's got that. Thank you so much. Okay, but what about the mind as impermanent in a sense of ongoing um, but changing? So like, would it be wrong view to say that mind moments persist um, before they, <laughs> um, you know, before they like disintegrate? I mean, how long does a mind moment last for? We have all of these like analysis, like we have this word like kana, um, which is Sanskrit um, shana. Uh, you know, how long, how long does it last for? Maybe if you're very good at the commentaries and things, you could give me a um, a breakdown of how long one shana actually is. Um, unfortunately, I cannot tell you. 
Um, but, you know, we, we observe something like we do observe something that we can call um, mind. And I mean, it's a bit of a philosophical argument um, in the early Buddhist schools, because technically, you know, what we are observing is actually like it's already passed by the time we observe it. Um, <laughs> so it all gets a little bit slippery when we when we try to when we talk about the present moment because all of these present moments these mind moments that we're observing are rapidly becoming past mind moments so if you're into savasti vardhan philosophy i mean you can get very um engaged in the whole like passage of time things um but yeah no there's something called um titi which means like stability or persistence um, which is something we observe in relation um, to the mind so having a sense of ongoing but changing, um, you know, I think that's quite a reasonable thing to observe. Um, you know, that's not, I wouldn't say that's wrong with you, I'd say that's an empirical observation based on reality. You know, what goes beyond reality, what oversteps, what can be observed is to go from that, that empirical observation. You know, I've seen something, um, we can call it a mental phenomenon or something like that. And to go from that and to say, um, this is uh, myself, this is, uh, you know, this is my permanent essence. So, yeah, I'd agree with you, Eugene, the first one's clearly wrong. Um, the second one is not wrong. Um, so it's not wrong to say the mind is, you know, it has something uh, called like persistence and like disintegrating. Um, you know, because as long as like you have that perception of disintegration, um, you know, that is the definition of impermanent, that, that's actually right for you. So I think that's fine. Um, okay, if that's all okay, um, so can I just get a confirmation, Eugene, like did what I say make sense or was I like just talking in circles? Was that all okay? Okay, so um, I'm going to go on the assumption that what I said was reasonable, and we can keep on moving on. Because I mean, if I say something that's unreasonable, it is important to let me know, because I can find a better way of explaining things. And I mean, I've said that to Ajahn Brahm before, I've said, Ajahn Brahm, like the explanation you gave me, it doesn't make sense. And you know, Ajahn just said, okay, um, because, you know, sometimes we might need to keep on looking until we find, um, you know, an explanation that can actually um, communicate what needs to be communicated. And that's okay, because the solution to doubt is asking good questions. So we have, um, we have stream entry, moving on to Majjhima Nikaya number two. This is the Sabhasava Sutta sometimes translated in English as all the taints. And here we have the subheading, unwise contemplations. So one who has not seen the tamma, i.e. the putijana, does not understand what things are fit for contemplation and what things are not. Thus, they contemplate on those things unfit for attention and not on those things fit for attention. Okay. So this is how you contemplate unwisely. Did my soul exist in the past? Did my soul not exist in the past? What was my soul in the past? How was my soul in the past? Having been what? What did my soul become in the past? Shall my soul be in the future? Shall my soul not be in the future? What shall my soul be in the future? How shall my soul be in the future? Having been what? What shall my soul become in the future? Or else you are inwardly perplexed about the present thus. Is this my soul? Is this not my soul? What is this soul? How is this soul? Where has this soul come from? Where will it go? Mm, interesting. And I mean, I suppose the audience is probably a little bit um, self-selecting this um, <laughs> evening. You know, the people who have chosen to be here are the people who are at least willing to entertain the idea um, of non-self. I once had an experience, actually, I was doing some interviewing for um, 
you know, I had this research grant. It was an undergraduate research grant and I was doing lived religion interviews in Queensland. So anyway, I went to the, um, I went to this Taoist temple and, you know, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to find the Taoist priest. And I'm just going to ask my interview questions and, you know, it will all be lovely. But anyway, I walked into the, um, to the Taoist temple, um, you know, and we, we met the priest. And from the moment I met this priest, like this priest was onto me. Um, he must have had like this sixth sense, like radar vision, like you, I must have been giving out blissed vibes or something. And he, he got like this kind of sense that, you know, this is, this person is a Buddhist <laughs> and, you know, I, I got the, I got the lecture. Um, you know, if, if all of you believe in uh, non-soul, you know, uh, uh, what, what makes us move? How do we breathe? How do we have life? Um, and he was quite, you know, I think he was quite horrified that this Buddhist had come into his, <laughs> um, into his temple with, you know, my, my heretical um, non-soul beliefs, because, you know, for certain world system, for certain like worldviews, you know, soul, it is an important concept. Like we have this Latin word animal, you know, what is an animal? An animal is that which breathes. It, it, um, it has like the animus, it has animation. Um, so in the ancient world, this concept of like, what's actually driving my breath, it was important. And, you know, for most religious world systems, like what actually constitutes um, belief, you know, belief means believing in the soul, belief means believing in an omnipotent God of some description. And to not believe in these things, it makes you an, you know, an outcast or, or a heretic. And it, it sometimes makes it quite awkward for Buddhists to attend uh, multi-faith or interfaith events because, you know, sometimes people will say, you know, we've all gathered here today to worship God in our own way. And it makes you, uh, um, you know, it, it can actually alienate Buddhists in particular in the context of chaplaincy. Because, you know, the whole idea of a modi faith chaplaincy, um, actually it's better to conceptualize these spaces as spaces where we can explore spirituality, you know, in conversation with each other. So, I mean, that yeah, for other religions, this is a big issue. Um, like, um, I mean, because we are in Western Sydney, you know, you see a lot of, um, religion here, you know, people in Western Sydney, it's a multicultural space, you know, there's, um, there's Christianity, there's Islam, like in Islam, you have this concept of, uh, um, again, you know, it's the, it's the soul, it's the spirit. So I'm sure there are people, if you said to them, you know, there is no, um, you know, there is no spirit, you know, they'd be scratching their head, like, what kind of an atheist are you? um you know there's that you're not going to go to heaven because you know you don't even believe in in something that that you're going to carry to heaven with you and that's going to be you know resurrected and judged on judgment day um but you know maybe we're preaching to the choir a little bit here um because this audience has already self-selected in the sense that i presume that um you're all kind of interested in in the idea of non-self and yet on that subtle, um, or rather, you know, sometimes not particularly subtle, um, free reflexive, um, subconscious level, we still, we still have this type of animistic belief. Um, so, you know, unless we're arahants, maybe we're not all as Buddhist as we think we are, because we're still, I mean, this concept, it, it's still lurking there. It's still somewhere deep in our psyche. We don't get to see it, but, you know, we get to see all of the other negative consequences. Um, you know, even if we had a relatively good day, like, did we actually get through today without being frustrated? You know, could we get through today without, <laughs> you know, like having the ambition, having the greed and the wanting? Um, you know, what's actually driving that stuff? Like, what's what's driving the complaint, the frustration, the, like the general unhappiness? Actually, there, there is a soul belief somewhere like you can't see it, but it's there because we see the evidence that that's um, 
yeah that's driving the the mass of negativity um anyway so that that brings us to the end of this evening um we are out of time but i hope that was um i hope that was okay i hope we've all followed so far maybe we've taken um something out of it you know and if if there are things there that are confusing you know maybe just let them sit for a bit and see if they make more sense by next week and like i said it's okay to raise questions at any time because that's the purpose of you know why we're doing this text so thank you everyone um thanks elise for hoping for for, for hoping for, for hosting <laughs> um and yeah i'll i'll see you all next week okay thank you thank you Aizira, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening um just a reminder that this uh recording uh yeah this recording will be posted on youtube when it's edited and done um and yeah remember to come back next week <laughs> okay great okay yeah. see you everyone bye bye yeah.